Welcome everybody to our little fireside chat about GitOps. In the call we have Alexis Richardson, who is the founder and probably your CEO or something like that at Weaveworks. We have Johannes Schnatterer from Cloudogu and myself, my name is Shlomo Shapiro. I'm working at Deutsche Bahn DB System. Um, the goal is that we a little bit figure out what is actually GitOps. And the reason I asked Alexis for this interview is that I have the impression that Alexis, you invented GitOps some time ago. So That's right. Can, can you maybe shed some light on how did you come to invent GitOps? What happened? What was the background? And why is it the thing that is going to save IT forever? Well, I'm glad that you think it's going to save IT forever. Um, so we, uh, I'm just trying to remember, it was some years ago, um, WeaveWorks started um, 2014. We had a team originally in London and then not long after that also in Berlin. Now, of course, we're an international company. We wanted to um, make it easy for uh, software developers to build and operate applications in this new environment of containers. And we cared about this because um, we had spent the last five years trying to build cloud applications ourselves from originally at RabbitMQ and then at VMware and Pivotal when I was in charge of the Rabbit team with Redis as well and Spring in, the, in all in one you know, company portfolio, which I was head of products for and trying to offer application development capability that would run anywhere in the cloud. Some of the ease of use maybe of things like Heroku was very challenging. And we tried different experiments. There was of course the cloud found different versions of Cloud Foundry. Um, there was OpenShift, which was essentially built on a similar set of principles, trying to make Heroku work in more environments, maybe behind the firewall, um, maybe on other clouds than Amazon. But the thing is that none of these solutions really provided much more than, in those days, a 12-factor application model, which I'm sure you've heard about. It's one pattern for a scalable web app. And they went a bit further on, but essentially, you know, you couldn't imagine um, more complex applications being pushed into this setting. Um, we could imagine lots of enterprise applications that were heavily data-oriented, not working well in this environment. Um, and there were assumptions in the architecture about how it was load balanced, um, how it would scale that meant it would work well for some things but not others and it wasn't particularly you know easy to set up and so on and what we what we saw was that um containers could be a better way forward because they provided a very simple operating model for a single node where you have a package which is also a runtime and it's kind of portable sort of kind of portable and also, if you spent five years trying to build applications out of VMs, as I did at VMware, you soon re realize that this is good for some things, but not everything, because VMs include extra software to make them reliable, so that virtualizing a, a real machine. But actually, what you want is something more ephemeral, something that you can start and stop quickly. Uh, it doesn't matter if it fails, you start another, you know, the whole cattle concept. And uh, all of these things were there in containers. So we had several different really nice properties uh, it's developer friendly. Um, it's a democratic model. Anyone can do it. You don't need to be understanding an architecture. Uh, you could see Node.js programmers doing it. You could see Python programmers doing it. You could see Spring Java programmers doing it. And this is all due to really the innovations by the Docker team around Solomon. So, you know, big kudos to Solomon for popularizing this and, and realizing just how important it was and pushing it through. And then, of course, there was this industry attention around it because you could see developers picking up this technology really quickly and running with it, which was we never saw with platform as a service. And so we started this company thinking, let's make it easy to build applications like Rabbit as a service, Redis as a service, or again, as I said, more complex things. Um, we could immediately see there were pieces missing. There was no network. Therefore, you couldn't build an application with two nodes. That was a problem. So we built a network, WeaveNet, that got us into the market and got us some funding. 
And then we built a um, set of tools around management and monitoring. So in those days, we thought that there would be developers building apps in the cloud and they would use containers instead of VMs and they would want to manage and monitor those applications. But what we didn't think was that um, they would pick and standardize on one orchestration technology because you could see there were lots of different different ways of organizing an application. And part of the freedom and appeal of containers was that you weren't pushed down one particular architecture. So we built an architecture orchestration agnostic tool, a management and monitoring tool, still running today called Weave Cloud, but lots of people are using it. It provides a deployment capability. It provides a monitoring capability and it unifies them. So you can do deployment, management, and monitoring. The thing is though that we ourselves had to choose an orchestration tool to run this on. We originally, of course, wrote our own and then realized, oh no, that's not a very clever thing to do. We've got a very, very, very small, good team, but we shouldn't be writing orchestration technology. We should be building on it. So let's pick one to run our stuff, our stack on. Remember this is 2015. Um, what was available? It was Docker Swarm, Nomad, Mesos, and Marathon, and um, Kubernetes. Remind me if there's anything else kicking around. I don't think so. There might've been some things from Spotify or some other companies that done microservices for a few years. So the problem with Docker Swarm was, it was a bit buggy and we've been trying to collaborate with the Docker team and community around networking and generally found that it wasn't a very smooth, completely seamless collaboration because Docker was already coming under pressure from its investors to try and carve out a certain terrain in the market. I think that created tensions between the, the commercial and open models, which they eventually resolved by completely separating them off with Moby later on. But at the time it was hard and we just couldn't feel that we could rely on Docker Swarm. Mesos was fascinating, but really general purpose technology, very abstract. You had to write marathon to make Mesos work so simply and nobody could really understand it. And there were things like ECS, which was early. Uh, we called up HashiCorp. They said, no, 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 don't use Nomad. It was version <laughs> 1.1 at the time. Um, and that left by process of elimination Kubernetes, uh, which we were sort of half a fan of because we could see that it was relatively well thought out, although a real architectural mess in the sense that you couldn't find any person to explain Kubernetes to you and you could only understand it by reviewing the design many, many, many times from different directions and eventually you became familiar with its unique shape and form. I mean, it's just far too complicated really. But complexity that had arisen for a reason, which was that the reason was, these are some of the bumps that you run into, these are things you learn and these are ways around them. And I think that was where the knowledge of the Google team was so important. We had people from Google in our company who had left Google, come to work with us. They'd been SREs, developers. And they were like, oh gosh, please, let's not use Google technology because it's got so many sort of googly things that would just, you know, frustrate us. But we had to pick something and really Kubernetes was the only game in town by 2015 for us. And so we had to become experts in installing, deploying and running Kubernetes. We'd already been trying to get something called Kubernetes Anywhere working, playing around with it, putting it on EC2 and things. That was Ilya's work, if you remember, Shlomo. But then, you know, getting Kubernetes up and running in 2015 was no joke. Um, not easy at all. It took us a long time. And eventually people said, we've got it working. We can install it. We can make it work. But it's a bit of a bugger, which is an English word. Now, we then built our stack on top and we had this SaaS. So we remember that we wanted to sell a product that was a SaaS product. So now we're operating Kubernetes on, on EC2, a couple of different staging areas, multiple zones for reliability. We have a stack of app components on top. We're deploying those. We've also got some monitoring and security baked into this. And after a while, you know, the process gets a bit simpler and faster and better. And we actually have some confidence and people are joining the team and extending the SaaS app. And one day, uh, it was a sunny spring day, maybe 2016, maybe 2017, I can't remember when, one of the engineers said loudly, 
I'm about to make a change, deploy a change to the system. I'm going to push a change to the system, which if, if it doesn't work quite as I intend, could wipe out our entire systems. So back then you were doing CI ops. Like we were you doing, not exactly, no. We had a, um, we had, no, we had a tool which was basically doing GitOps, but I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, we were not pushing from CI in a CI ops sense. CI ops is a very is a massive anti pattern. So um, anyone who says that they're doing GitOps and they're doing CI ops has just not understood the point. So anyway, that's another story because on the day, um, the whole system basically got wiped out by that change. And um, this is a person who often did this kind of thing, so it wasn't a huge surprise. But we didn't manage to stop him. You know, it's like no, don't do that, and then you hear the click and then two seconds later oh fuck and then you know yes the whole team springs into action into you know issue resolution team mode they got the whole thing back up in about 40 minutes and i said that was pretty quick it's quite a complex system how did we do that and they said well it's a lot of these practices that we learned work actually working in google these other places to do with infrastructure as code and devops and automation but fundamentally we can do this quickly because we have a, an image of the entire system, not just the cluster, but the app and the monitoring and other pieces, all described in various config files in Git. And whenever we make a change to the system, we do so by um, first making sure that the change has been committed and then allowing the change to propagate automatically through into production. So this was the very early sort of version 0.1 elements of GitOps. Um, today, we have much more sophisticated concepts. Um, but notice there was no requirement that everybody had to use Git and write PRs. It was simply that um, you couldn't allow a change to happen if it was a permanent change in the system without, without also committing it to the system of record for the desired state, which was stored in a resilient, distributed, authenticated, non-repudiable, secure, GitHub instance. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And I said, well, you know, what, what, uh, what else are we doing that's interesting? And so we talked about that and we wrote down all the principles that the team had learned and built themselves from Kubernetes. And they said, look, Kubernetes is particularly amenable to working this way because it's based on declarative config. But we've also applied the concept of declarative config to other parts of the system like the, the dashboards, for example, and we've also, and the apps, and we've also made it possible to do things like alerting when the system which is trying to converge to its correct state isn't doing so. We'll fire an alert, stick in a, in a message into Slack with a link and you can click on it, open up the dashboard. And um, we can also force convergence in pieces that Kubernetes is not itself traditionally controlling. So Kubernetes, the orchestrator's job is to have an eventually consistent convergence model around the cluster state based on what's in your YAML file. This is, again, basic level. And today, we have more complicated things with templates and generated things and so on and so on. But at that basic level, the YAML file drives convergence in the cluster. And so the cluster takes that YAML file, holds a copy of it in memory, and uses that to force convergence. We did that. We had applied that in other areas of the stack. And I said, that's really interesting. And so we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it and sort of drove the list of principles down, down, down to just a few. And I was thinking, you know, this is pretty cool. We should talk about this more. And then one day we were talking about it and I just suddenly realized that one word that we could use to describe all of this was GitOps. Because the fundamental thing we were doing was making operations automatic for the whole system based on a um, model of the system, which was living outside the system. And Git was where we had chosen to put that model. But of course, there is no absolute requirement that it be in Git. In fact, you could do Git ops without any Git at all if you really wanted to. But then we don't want to talk about SVN ops because when you're in the world of naming things, it really helps if the name is one that somebody else can say. Um, and so then I went downstairs. We were at the time working in um, Shoreditch, where we still have a small office now that we have lockdown in London here. Most people are working from home, but we've retained a little footprint in Shoreditch. And we were sharing a building with James Governor from Redmonk, 
that you may have read some of his work called Stephen O'Grady's Developers of the New Kingmakers is very good. And I went to see James and said, hi, James, I just want to run something by you. What is your reaction if I say the word GitOps to you? Um, and he said, well, that's, a, that's possibly the ugliest word I've heard in a long time. And I'm not sure I can unhear it now. So I thought, excellent, we have a winner. <laughs> Um, because you can say this thing and it sticks in somebody's head. They can't undo it. So it gives them a way, a hook into thinking about something. Now, this is important because, you know, um, when we wrote down, I made it my job to write down a description of what, what I thought the team was, the engineering team was doing. And it was really an operating model because it gives you a way to think about your entire stack's operations. It also has this very nice security property because when you make a change, you only update the, the image repos or the Git configs or some of the other stores with immutable information. So that is then pulled into the running system, which gives you a different security model from one where you're pushing directly in through the authentication layer. Anyway, um, all of these quite complex ideas with deep, deep, deep ramifications really could be rolled up into a set of smaller set of principles, which we've talked about a lot and I can bring up some slides to show you if, if you want me to. Yeah, sure, but, please do. Um, okay, let me do that in just a second. Um, let me finish the story and then I'll bring up the slides. The, um, the, the uh, I'm losing my train of thought now, thanks. We started talking. The complete world yeah. description in okay. Git. This is, the, this is the, the, there were several things that made me realize we should talk about this more. One was I thought what the team had done was important and it wasn't just about having automated pipelines because they also needed to have the full description, the way that metadata was used, the ability of the system to update itself, a drift alerting, dealing with stacks on top of the cluster itself at runtime, not just building a machine. All of these things were implied by, but evolu evolutions from things like Puppet and, and, and Terraform and, and Chef that had been around doing 95% of this stuff, but in a slightly different way. It had just gone further, and it was an absolute position where it could actually do much more. Kubernetes was really the breakthrough to make it possible. Now, I wrote it all down, started talking about it, and people said, this is how we do things, or this is how we want to do things. We're trying to get there. Or we've been talking about what to do, and you've written down a way of, which captures the idea we had really nicely. Or um, people would say, I'm trying to introduce a lot of changes into my organization because I know we need continuous delivery. I know we need deployments and updates and patches. And I know we need elements of automation and we need scalable management. And we need these things to be correct due to the automation and the programmatic updates. All of this is GitOps. And you've given us a way with just one word to carry this change through the organization. And so I thought that's really nice because it's an ugly word and it doesn't always mean exactly what you think it means because, you, as I said, you don't absolutely have to use Git. But if people benefit by having a way to create an entry point into a world where they can make changes that are actually really meaningful and useful to development teams and hence to IT, that's great. And so then I realized that um, we needed to make sure that... Um, we didn't see GitOps was something that everybody could talk about, everybody could do. It wasn't supposed to be like a WeWorks product. And so we talked about it in a way that it was described what we were doing. We had some open source software, Flux uh, and Flagger, which does progressive delivery in a GitOps style and other things like cluster management. All of that stuff was, if you like, reference implementations of GitOps ideas. But there are other people like the, the T people at Cloudbees, um, people in other companies like Replicated, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, all doing GitOps, okay? All doing GitOps um, themselves and sometimes in their own way. So by talking about it in a way that it wasn't owned by us and anybody could own it, more people described their own vision of how they could do this kind of automation, model-driven automation. And as a result, that's allowed people to make their own stories and investments which is why uh, an industry trend has arisen because it is actually 
the right way to do DevOps and CI CD and, and management for Kubernetes. It scales, it's secure. And it also, the really cool thing is you don't, if you're a developer, you don't need to understand Kubernetes to make changes if you can be given a way to update the desired state. Now, of course, there are many problems like people think, oh, I don't like using Git. Okay, great. You know, use a UI that goes into Git, things like that. There are many things we can do better. Um, there are challenges like how do you manage secrets? But, you know, all of these things gradually are being overcome with different solutions. And it's really nice that you can do it in many, many different ways. Let me see if I can find these um, slides for you quickly. Um, um, this may even be a public link, so I'm going to also share it with you here, Shlomo and Johannes. This is a slide from FOSDEM at the weekend, a presentation made by our CTO, Cornelia. I apologize for the WeaveWorks branding on some of the slides. We had not, we made them not, quick. It's not public, so I just sent you an access request. Okay, let me let me sort that out for you. I can also show them on the screen. Hold on. Maybe a that's the easiest for the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. I should explain that this. Can you see everything? Yep. Yep. This is a slide presentation of a new thing called the GitOps working group in the CNCF underneath the auspices of the SIG for app delivery. So it shouldn't have any WeaveWorks branding on it. It should just be Cloud Native Foundation branding. I'm sorry about that. But what's happened is we've used the foundation's legal umbrella and auspices for collaboration to bring together about 80 people from about 50 companies talking about what is GitOps in a way that lets us as a community come up with a, a robust, if you like, definition that people can then uh, work from, okay? This is great because uh, it means that we stop arguing about you know, whether X or Y or X plus Y is exactly GitOps, but also it, it will mean that people can say things like, well, our system isn't 100% GitOps, but we do the first half and then we do this other thing in a different way. Okay, so let's have a quick look. Um, this is Cornelia's bio. So yeah, I mean, it's about mapping from the model, which is in uh, a code, code config and potentially some kind of user experience to update it and the runtime environment. And we see this as a cycle of um, updating the, system, the desired system of record in Git and then deploying changes, observing them and then managing them, um, which might mean updates back to Git. So in, in, in the GitOps world of WeaveWorks today, one of the things we're doing is also sending information back to the desired state that reflects what the runtime state thinks it's doing. Um, so this is typically how you'd merge with a continuous integration tool like Jenkins, GitLab, Travis CI, GitHub Actions. And hang on a second, please. Uh, wait a sec. Okay. Um, so we see the world really in two, two parallel cycles of what we think of as um, dev test and CI on the left. And then um, runtime, usually production on the right. And the convergence here is an eventually consistent, continual change, always driving to a correct state. So it isn't the case that you have an automated pipeline and do a push and update, and then that's, that's GitOps. It is the case that there are um, agents, sorry, agents uh, inside Kubernetes in this case, and potentially other systems that are always pushing for convergence between the desired state and the running state. That means that if you drift from the correct state, the agents will try to fix your application back to the correct state. 
and alert you if they can't, for example. And it means that, um, you know, once that you, if you ask somebody, do you know if your fleet of clusters is in the right state? Um, if they've had, if they've had no alerts, they will say, yes, I think everything is in the correct state. So that's very powerful. And this means, of course, you can use any CI tool as a foundation for your GitOps, provided you also have the operational pieces, which we we've works provide for you. So commercially as a company now, you know, we focus on the stuff on the right and we recommend that you use one of the known Git providers and a good CI tool on the left. So we work with GitLab, we work with GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, this is a slightly more uh, complex slide, which I'm not gonna try to explain, but essentially with Flux 2, which is a reference implementation of GitOps, we've discovered that it's useful to think in terms of an additional cycle, for example, you might compile some of your um, some of your config from uh, a from documents for policy, from YAML files, or even from TypeScript. So here are the principles that we've found to be fairly stable. Um, notice that um, I mentioned earlier the GitOps working group that has taken a version of these principles and and is working and expanding them. So you know. We've worked wrote down some some sort of thoughts we had about this and just essentially nailed them to the door and said, "Hey, everybody, let's let's take this as a starting point, version 0 0.01, and everybody can iterate from here." So where, where we end up in the community process may be maybe slightly different, but I hope it's at least consistent uh, with this. Um, so here you can see we want everything that we can describe to be decide, described declaratively. Having a declaration of the intended state allows us to do continuous operations instead of having a set of imperative commands that may or may not succeed and have to be checked to see if they've out if the outcome has been correct which is something that's hard to scale to large scale systems and to many systems um, we recommend using git because it has beautiful properties for the version management of these state descriptions you can use other things and sometimes you want to use git as well as additional stores um, we have a tool called libgitops that lets you do that. Um, once changes have been approved, which may be a manual policy step for some, it is then possible for them to be automatically applied to the system by agents. And those agents continue running to ensure correctness and act against divergence. And now the GitOps working group, you can see there was some interesting companies involved in creating this. First time we got Microsoft, Amazon, and GitHub into the room at the same time uh, for a few seconds, which is really good. And then a bunch of other folks joined. And it's very much an open process under the foundation, um, which uh, is all very good. This is the CNCF radar showing that Flux is a very popular tool with Helm for this. SIG app delivery is the CNCF's place of discussing CICD and app delivery and, and GitOps management. And that's how they're related. So I guess that brings you up to speed. You know, what I haven't talked about is some of the, you know, interesting discussions around, well, how do you do progressive delivery? Or what's the data story? What's the secret story? Or how do I generate um, the right number of repos if I have a thousand cluster fleet? Or actually, how do I do cluster management? All of these things, happy to try and talk about. Um, but I hope I've given you a good overview up to the present day. Thank you. Thank you. This is really good. Um, so first of all, I would like to mention that problems like secret management are not related to GitOps. We had these problems before and we've been using Git before. Uh, so I think that everything that was done properly before continues to work properly. Everything that was a bad practice before GitOps continues to be a bad practice, even after introducing GitOps. Yes, that's true, Shlomo, but let me put it another way. When we first clarified what we, what we thought GitOps should be, and we said, look, this is an evolution of DevOps. It's adding the operations piece, the missing piece, to the DevOps pipeline and developer automation concept. Uh, and you can do everything in this way now, and then you can have automation for your operations as well as for your dev. And people said, well, okay, I've, we've got questions. 
And we had this FAQ essentially frequently asked. The first question everybody would ask is what about secrets? And I'm like, what do you mean what about secrets? And they would say, well, you say everything has to be in Git. Does that mean secrets should be in Git? And we would say, well, no. Okay, so you've got a good point. We shouldn't say everything has to be in Git. So you know, we have to clarify these assumptions. Otherwise, thousand, you know what the ten, the personality of the technical mind is usually to find to to ask questions as a way of clarifying what's going on. So now I think people have a better understanding. And of course, you're correct, Shlomo. But people didn't realize that because they were thought we were being absolutists about everything must exactly be written in Git. It's not the case. I mean, uh, I have this conversation almost on a daily basis. What about secrets in Git? Uh, partially also because I wrote a policy recently that explained how to put secrets in Git, which is obviously encrypted. Um, but then the question is, well, why do we need to version them whatsoever? And I say, well, if you don't version them in Git, where do you version them? Or we don't version them. Well, whoever allowed you to have unversioned content going into production? So actually, in my opinion, you need to version secrets. And if I have a versioning system for 99.99% of all my strings or text in the in the application, why not use it for this last uh, percentile as well? How about this? I mean, typically you make a complex change to your application. You change the app, you add services, you might change the data model a bit. You might make some changes around the permissions and secrets. You might change the dashboard. You roll out all of these changes as part of an, up an upgrade or an update. Um, if you want to roll back, you want to roll back all of the changes, not some of them, right? You need to be either on the updated version or the previous version. You can't have a dashboard that is on the old version looking at the new code or the new dashboard looking at the old code most of the time. Same thing with secrets. I can't, I mean, people who think you shouldn't version control your, um, your systems are, in my opinion, stuck way in the past. I know that you're fighting this, so you're sympathetic. But um, I mean, obviously, you can also, you might be using something like Vault. We, we love Vault. You know, sealed secrets is great. That's one way of doing it. There's other, there's other, there's other encryption ways of doing it in Git. Vault is also a very nice tool because it integrates with other en enterprise secret systems and gives you a central panel. You can make this work in a GitOps style too. There's so many things that you can do. I mean, I always uh, ask people, well, if you keep your secrets somewhere else, for example, in Vault, how do you play the four eyes approval process there? And if the answer is we don't, I say, why? Why do you not have that four eyes approval process for such an important change like a secret that will take your entire application down if it's wrong? And, and I find this to be a very circular discussion, which in my experience always ends up with, well, in the end, we do the same as we would be doing with Git just somewhere else. You know, I mean, I'm not, we, we really don't want to be overzealous about right. insisting that every single thing has to be done this way. I mean, you know, do, I don't know if you're familiar with the George Orwell's rules of clear writing. Have you come across this famous? Yeah, I've seen it once. Uh, it's really good. Let me see if I can bring it up on Google. Um, whoops. George Orwell. Uh, clear. Rules for writing clear English. Six rules. It should be five. Someone should have told him. Um, here we go. Never do this, never do that. The last rule is break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. You know, and, and GitOps is the same, I think. You know, by all means, break the rules. If there are rules, good. But also ignore them if your system needs something different for a reason. Let's not be overzealous. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned the declarative descriptions to be the base for GitOps success, which is really very close. Oh, uh, can I share the screen, please? Let me stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Yeah. Um, so this is really 
close to what I'm trying to, to show people or to explain, uh, which is that for me, uh, GitOps is actually a way how we rescue a lot of the, like rescue us, our systems, our environments, our organizations even, from a lot of the challenges that we face. And I always try to show that actually the, the core principle is declarative descriptions. That is the one change that allows all the other things to happen. And yeah. why I explain that is that separating between declarative descriptions and deployment automation allows to have separate tests where you test the uh, automation for correctness and the descriptions for compliance. And if you mix uh, the de declarative descriptions with the deployment automation, like in the good old puppet times, then you can't test them independently. Or if you have a bash script that does an important job, you can't test the correctness independently from the compliance. Right. So for me, this is actually the core principle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find it very hard to convince people to really go this 100% everything has to be declarative. Right, and it's hard. What do you, I mean, what if you don't have a way of declaring things that's good? Let's, give, let's take an example, workflows. Show me a good declarative workflow model. It's hard. They end up being basically a nested tree of S steps of the workflow. Why don't you just write down the workflow and not put it in XML, for God's sake. Anyway, look, I think um, you should be part of the GitOps working group. It's a, it's a, a contributor-driven uh, community. So please do get, get involved and, and help to shape these emphases because this is gonna get nailed on as, as a definition of GitOps and your contribution could be, could be very important in that process. Okay. Yes. That's, Let's not be absolutist. Like Actually, we, hope like, to be able to, yeah. we hope to describe more things in the future. Well, luckily, Another, my company is already a CNCF uh, member. You don't like, even need to be a okay. CNCF member at a company level. Any individual can, can just contribute. Oh, nice. Very good. It's just Linux. <laughs> anyway. But other, another objection people have is, well, what if I don't have time to go through Git? You know, do I am I saying that I have to do a transaction in Git to do an update in the operational system? Sometimes that's too high high latency, or, or sometimes I'm unsure of my change. So I might do a branch. How do I do a provisional transaction and look at the effects of a change on a branch before committing that to the to the main uh, system? <laughs> so people are asking these questions now, which are very interesting questions. The other one is also how many repos should I have if I have lots of clusters? What's the best way to organize my repos? Do I want to have more repos than clusters? You know, this kind of thing. And some of these are a matter of taste, but you know, we need better answers to some of them than we than people jump at today. And we're going to get there soon. But that's exciting. It shows you that it's not a trivial concept. Yeah. Actually, um, you mentioned that. Uh, CI ops is actually an anti-pattern. Yeah. Um, as it happens, <laughs> I get the impression that we as an industry are currently very much stuck on CI ops. Um, uh, we have this map, which we try to use as a discussion tool. And I have the theory that we come from the lower left corner, we're like dev against ops and we do a manual ops and as an industry, we took a great step towards the IOPS, which is a big step both towards ops automation and towards uh, DevOps, so which I see the as, a, as a culture thing. And my okay. impression is that now we discuss what's the next step. Yeah, look, first thing is stop. Can I steal your slides? They're great. Yes. I love them both, especially this one. This is really, really cool. Um, and actually, it's very, very important to be respectful of everybody starts in a different place in the journey. Maybe you're starting in the bottom left. That's okay, because maybe you have a system that doesn't need updating frequently. Maybe you have a large team of approvals people. We spoke to a bank that the where marketing needed to approve any change to the mobile app, because the GUI might change, 
And what happened was there was once a change that marketing people were very embarrassed about and they got angry and they said, you may never make a change to this app without showing us first. So the, the automated pipeline included filing a ticket in Jira, sending an email to the marketing team. They had to check the GUI was still okay before, the, before it could go through. But, it, but that was what, you know, I mean, we laughed about it, but that was what the organization needed for that, for that app. And the marketing team needed to have a stake in the process. And then of course, um, small scale changes, occasional changes. If you do something manually or you do something using KubeCuttle, SSH, or through a GUI tool that does an update, you know, the GUI tool updates Kubernetes and the application. You do this with something like Rancher, which is not a GitOps tool. And then you don't know whether your system is in the state that the GUI tool just told you it was in. But this is okay for small scale. But when you have more than one cluster and more than one team, more than one change per day, you do want to be um, automated and programmatic if you can be. So you start adding your CI. And the CI lets you run scripts. But the problem is, if you run a lot of scripts and something breaks halfway through, you don't know whether you're in a correct state because your mechanism for verifying correctness is based on the CI tool updating this, the system and then looking at a monitor to see if you've got the results you wanted. And that cannot prove or assert correctness. It can only give you a way of observing that correctness may indeed be the case. Whereas what, what you have with GitOps is inside the cluster, you have agents that can see everything in the state, in the running state, and check that against the desired state so that it can tell you whether the cluster is in the correct state or not. So you have guarantees. But maybe you don't need those guarantees. Maybe you're happy having a system that's having a few changes a day. Wait, I don't believe that the observation of the correct deployment of cluster resources actually guarantees that the application fulfills its purpose. No, it doesn't guarantee that it fulfills its purpose. So I, still example, need, I still need external yeah. monitoring to make sure that my application is actually serving my customers or doing its purpose beyond the fact that it's all up and running. Right. Well, that, there's two parts to the answer to that. One is, yes, you're right. So, for example, um, maybe I deploy a container. The container starts and then immediately crashes. And then it reboots and then it immediately crashes. Is that a correct or incorrect behavior? So I need to have some tools to help me detect this and do, do stuff about it. Secondly, this goes back to your point, I can't declare everything today. So um, if, if I could describe my customer SLAs declaratively and, and verify those inside the runtime, then I could check the application was doing what it should be doing for my customer. But today we don't have many tools that help us to do that. So yes, I agree with you. That's part of the gradual transition, which is why I'm saying that I think it's okay to be somewhere in the middle of this picture a lot of the time. Um, so this picture is kind of a discussion tool I, I came up with because nice. I realized that at least for me, DevOps is really a culture thing. DevOps is the, the way how we improve the way how people work together. And there's actually another dimension, which is technology, which is the mm -hmm. question, how far do we automate processes and essentially take our hands out of production? And my, yes. my personal I belief is that, that if we like push both to the maximum, like maximum automation and maximum kind of people working together on, on a kind of same, on the same eye level, then of course we get to hands off operations which uh, where I see GitOps as, as a major stepping stone towards achieving that goal. I hope yes. that GitOps will be the, the tool to make that happen, uh, but maybe there will be some other evolution that comes after GitOps. I'm pretty sure that GitOps is the next correct step that we should take in that direction. Um, I think we're still exploring the technology consequences and until we finished exploring them, we won't know what the cultural impact is. So you see us currently working more on the tech side than on the culture side, actually. The tech side is easier to move forward quickly because culture change can be slow. 
Uh, I mean, I believe that we're having a conversation. I'm in England, you're in Germany. We both live in a country which has large organizations, which are you know, very regulated, banks, utilities, uh, hospitals, and so, you know, culture change is slow for a reason. People wish to be careful, uh, conservative about introducing change too fast because it might have an impact on people. So the technology can race ahead in, at times. I think we're having one of those moments today. Well, uh, my favorite hobby is to bring up new technology that helps to change the culture, as I believe that changing culture through technology is much easier than changing culture without technology or without a, an accompanying change in how we work. Because- I think you're very, very, very sensible to say that. I think we were like uh, animals of habit, so to speak. And if we change our habits, it helps us a lot to change our culture and our thinking and actually even our beliefs. Like if you do it often enough in a different way, you really believe that this way works well and eventually you come to believe that this is a better way. But you need I mean, the experience to, to believe that. It's like the, the unexpected changes that occur once a technology has been adopted. Let's take, for example, the mobile phone. You know, when the mobile phone first appeared, um, it was big, it was hard to move around and people would use it instead of essentially a radio system. Um, but when it got small enough, it was possible to be to be contactable. Um, but then what really made it break through was the, the idea that it could be used as a computer and uh, you know, also other things like photographs and so on. And people thought, ah, oh, okay, it's actually useful to have a powerful computer on your person. And that, that creates social change. And so I see, for example, my parents who are you know, um, in their seventies and eighties respectively, you know, happily using WhatsApp to do emojis with each other because it's something where that, that that concept of group chat has been introduced to them through technology. Now I think that's a bit a bit of a fun, silly example, but I do think that actually you're quite right that it would be impossible to introduce that sort of change without putting the tool in their hands to make it easy. So about the tech progress, um, I have another picture. Sorry, it's not colored. Um, which tries to depict the different layers that we find in a GitOps world. So we have yeah. some sort of utmost layer, which is the, the Git repository for one application. And I can do GitOps between this Git repository for one application and let's say a Kubernetes namespace or even an application running inside. Yeah. And if I go one step outside, I have maybe a Git repository that is coupled with a namespace, where I say mm -hmm. that whatever is in the namespace has to be in that Git repository. Yeah. And so far down till we come to the, well, let's have one Git repository for the cloud account and everything that's in the cloud account should be there. And I have the impression that this is already the place where actually GitOps fails at the moment because we don't have the tools. I haven't seen many places that play this GitOps game on the cloud account level where they say, if I delete a, file, a line from a YAML file, then a whole bunch of CloudFormation stacks will be deleted as a result or something like that. So I think we will see that in the future. Because uh, I believe that the question, how do you delete stuff, is a good question to understand how honestly people actually implemented GitOps. So we had a bug in Flux for a while when, um, well, no, not a bug. There was a complex feature around the difference between moving and, and deleting elements of a repo. That's all been fixed now, and I can't remember the technical details, but it was quite challenging mentally to sort of follow through all the reasoning. Now it's all done correctly, but you know, there's, there's some real deep technology trickery that you need to think through with some of this stuff. And so you have to be super careful what delete means, for example. Um, I mean, I would, I would say this is a good list. I like the way you've got it as a sort of production ready journey. Um, we, we, there, are, there are other things as well. So you've got tools like ACK on Amazon and Microsoft and Google have one as well, which is basically a Kubernetes CRD for describing bindings to external services like RDS and, and Route 53 and all those things. Um, then you have um, service management, so Flagger, 
allows you to state properties of a canary, AB rollouts, that kind of thing, and manage those declaratively. There's a tool called Grafana Lib, which lets you manage Grafana dashboards declaratively. Um, we have CAPI in Kubernetes, which is essentially goes hand in hand with GitOps. Um, also ways of describing add-ons to Kubernetes clusters. So typically you might have a base cluster and then Prometheus Helm, something else added as a standard baseline on top of that. And then you might have a machine learning environment consisting of TensorFlow and two or three other libraries. And then finally, you might have the application. So dealing with all of that is through GitOps is actually great, but um, does require more elements of your of your diagram. Um, still, I really like the diagram. Um, down at the bottom of the stack, we've experimented with uh, this tool Weave Ignite, which is a wrapper around Firecracker, which is an Amazon tool written in Rust to do uh, a virtual machine for Lambda, um, and um, it's a very lightweight, very secure, fast starting virtual machine that potentially could be used, for example, in edge computing by telcos and trained companies, for instance. And um, Ignite gives it a nice Docker-like API for people who are more developer friendly. Um, we've got some declarative config in there and I can imagine there being more. I think networking will, will have more and more declarative config because networking is the one thing which would be really great if somebody could automate operating that stuff um, and so on. So yeah, lots, lots to say about this. It's just an emerging space. So do you agree that actually GitOps is a bit slim, the lower we go in the stack and that maybe hardware is not yet a domain that has been conquered by GitOps? Agreed. Let's see. Um, okay. Well, my main question was if you would confirm this picture. So there's another thought that we have, which is uh, again on this people versus organization um, scale. Hold, hold on, if I may, I can. I like the picture. I would say I confirm it. I would say that it is a particular point of view down a very important narrow middle track of the world of GitOps, and I think it's good for that. But it's not a comprehensive picture. No, 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 no. It's uh, my point here is really. How far down in the stack are you willing to do GitOps nowadays? Okay. And my observation is many people are maybe in the first two or maybe three levels, yeah. uh, but I don't see people really working on the fourth level, which is the AWS account with GitOps, like with full-blown GitOps. Meaning if you okay. delete it in Git and commit and push, then it's actually gone, including the data that was there. Got it. Um, so the other thought that I kind of had was with this DevOps uh, people versus automation technology landscape, I have the impression that at the moment as an industry, we're investing more into the DevOps culture change than into the tech change, which leads to some sort of roundabout way towards reaching this goal of hands-off operation. And, and I think 10 million euro is not much compared to what many companies spend on this culture change. Uh, so I'm always wondering, how would I start a discussion to spend maybe a bit more money than that on the required technology change to actually get there where we want to be? Because otherwise we'll just stop with a great culture and a lousy technology. Good question. I don't know the answer. I mean, we sell products. Um, I don't think anyone's paid us $10 million for one of our products yet. It would be a good thing to do, of course. Um, I think that typically we would like to say that a, a big organization can achieve meaningful change using six and seven figure sums of money. It isn't necessary to use eight figure sums of money to achieve change, you should be moving in smaller steps. Because, and this is part of the underlying conceptual principle, we iterate in small steps to make our journey the right one. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for the insights. It's a lot of stuff to think about. Um, Johannes, I think you also had some questions prepared. Sorry for yeah, picking up. Definitely, yeah, that's all right. Uh, one, one point I particularly find interesting is the definition of GitOps. 
the slides you just shared, Alexis, about uh, from the GitOps working group and the four principles, I think you called them. Uh, yeah. This definition actually has been following me around for, for some time because I wrote an article or I'm writing an article about GitOps tools and comparing them. So I had a look at about, I think it was almost 50 tools that called themselves uh, GitOps. And it's they had... Different. <laughs> they had uh, different definitions of what GitOps is really about. And uh, I, I think you you already had uh, th those principles or similar ones on one of your blog posts. So I had a look at them and tried to match. And also what my ideas about GitOps were. And it uh, for me, it turned out to be like uh, three things that some of them had in common and some of them had only one or two of the uh, properties like it's the, the reconciliation loop and the pool uh, principle i think those are combined in the agent software principle you had on your slide and uh, another one was the operations by pull request and right. my my question is also, you, you talked about uh, not being too overzealous, <laughs> but uh, it was difficult for me to judge which tools are actually GitOps tools. Like, do they, have to, do they have to have all of those properties or is it enough to have one of them or two of them? Or did I miss anything? Is there anything else that they should fulfill to be considered GitOps? So what you're raising is an interesting question because I suppose that uh, my view is GitOps is not a property of a tool. It is a property of somebody's actual system. So it's an end-to-end -end property of a system, just like security is a, and reliability and availability are properties of a system. So um, you wouldn't say that a web browser is an availability tool, but you might say that um, if, the, if a system is accessed mainly through a web browser and the system itself is highly available, making web browsers the main way in is, a, is part of making that possible because everybody has a web browser. You can, if it crashes, you can restart it, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, each individual um, system that somebody sets up, whether it's in a company or in a cloud or some, some other way, can be said to be a GitOps system or not. And so um, then each tool that is used to make that possible could be regarded as a partial enabler of the whole system's GitOps property. So for instance, um, you could imagine having new tools for making Git itself a much more pleasant and humane experience for normal people, which is something a lot of people want. Um, or lots of user interface stuff that is that is beautiful user experience and then underneath plugs into the system so that everything's done correctly so that you don't have changes that are not tracked, for example. Such a tool could be argued to be a GitOps tool because it's providing fundamental enabling technology for part of the overall process. And I think that's okay. Um, by the same to token, you know, I've mentioned a few times Flux and Flagger. Um, if you want to use Flux to manage a fleet of Kubernetes clusters, which you can, then you also use the cluster management cluster API, CAPI, to do that. And that lets you combine a declarative definition of a cluster with a tool for enforcing declarative correctness continuously and patching and supporting things continuously. So you've taken two technologies and put them together to achieve a fleet management system that works through GitOps. So again, it's the end system that is GitOps or not, and the individual components are enabling GitOps to happen in that way. And so the question then becomes, well, what's the best way to talk about um, these tools? And I think it's okay for somebody to say, you know, if you use GitLab, then you can achieve GitOps. Because I believe that to, to achieve GitOps, you should use a decent GitOps tool like GitLab or GitHub and the operations tools, because GitLab is not a tool for managing operations, doing security patches, rolling out platforms, keeping them correct, doing service rollouts. 
but it's a damn useful tool for plugging in the dev side of all of that. So, you know, I think that means that when you see people like GitLab running around saying, we actually invented GitOps and everything <laughs> is about us, you have to let them do that because, you know, that that's their way. Uh, it's, it's sort of centering everything around their universe. But the reality is that, that the whole system will be made up of GitLab and many other components, hopefully, obviously from Weaveworks, um, or GitHub and Weaveworks, or maybe both, sometimes both, sometimes Atlassian, Gitea, so many other things. So really, um, I think for me, we need to make sure that people understand what is a GitOps system and not get too hung up about whether tools call themselves GitOps or not. I really like how you put GitOps clearly on the on the behavioral scale. So GitOps is a, an attribute of a, the behavior of an entire system. Same as I always try to tell people that DevOps is not a tool, but DevOps is the result of doing the right thing between people on how people work together. So maybe GitOps is also much more the result of doing the right thing in your systems no matter which tool you use and actually how the people work together. Only those things that may be described, programmed and, auto and observed can be described to be automatic. Yeah, very nice. If you try to put this definition forward, like uh, on the, the map that Shlomo showed with uh, production readiness, like kind of decreasing the the nearer we get to the physical hardware, what do you think would have to kind of evolve to, to, to get this production readiness onto those lower layers? Like, or would oh, you say, you just... so my question basically is, at the moment, would you say there is tooling to do what Shlomo said, to do GitOps on this, on this uh, AWS account level? Um, so what I see happening is people adopting GitOps because it's the right operating model for cloud native and associating it with their Kubernetes machinery and systems and services on Amazon, for example, EKS, that's great. And now EKS anywhere, of course, um, that will probably mean that the more systems touch Kubernetes and containers on that cloud provider and their associated offerings, the more that GitOps will, will creep in and become a way to operate associated components like the ACK library that I mentioned joins the world of Kubernetes with controlling external services. Now, um, that means that pretty soon, if containers and uh, obviously functions and micro VMs become the norm for how we run our applications globally, uh, which I think is happening more and more, then um, eventually all of the other tooling will catch up. And that will mean that there will be demand for an expectation for declaratively managed um, fundamental tools for the bottom layer in your, in your picture. And why not? And actually, I discovered that when we talked about GitOps, I learned from, um, for example, there are people who make hardware firewalls or even some other network switch type technology who have been working in this way for some time. And they actually have the, the standard in some of these segments of the industry is that you have declarative tools for provisioning your setup in your um, hardware. But, but those are esoteric. They're associated with the narrow function, however important. Now what we're doing with GitOps is seeing things pooling around much larger, deeper pools of technology, like the whole Kubernetes as a platform concept. So I think that will create more, more momentum for more change, which will eventually lead to all of it, but we're not there yet. And that's okay. And we haven't mentioned Terraform yet. I think that's a great uh, GitOps type of tool. Uh, I think it doesn't have drift alerts in the um, free version, but I think if you pay for it, you get some kind of more GitOps automation, hands-free alert system. So you mentioned um, applications and managing more via GitOps. 
Uh, what's your opinion on managing data by GitOps tooling? There's Joe Bader was asking about this on Twitter this week. I've seen a few things. There's people doing things like, um, you know, DVCC or whatever it's called, which is the, the open metadata store for machine learning applications. Um, there are there's a couple of years ago, tools from Replicated, an LA based Kubernetes company for doing some database schema management through GitOps. Um, I think this will come into the market in stages. For most of the apps that people are writing around Kubernetes, you can get a very long way by not worrying too much about the data versioning. But of course, eventually, it will be really nice to, to correlate between data snapshots and things in, in the application stack in a more meaningful way. I see it as open territory um, for people to go after. Don't forget, though, if you, if you let people version control their data, they'll want to roll back. And that may lead you into some computationally adventurous parts of the landscape. I mean, the reason I'm asking is that my personal experience is that kind of the day two operations problem is actually one of the biggest problems for IT, which yes. is after setting up something, how do you actually run it for years in production doing updates, upgrades, backup, disaster recovery, uh, performance tuning, whatnot, which is for me all kind of some day two, day three problem. And yeah, the answer is you don't, you don't do it by fiddling with a GUI. You do yeah. it through GitHub. And that's why you need tools from WeaveWorks. So, yeah. So what does the WeaveWorks tooling offer for day two operations? I mean, we... I my data in RDS and it's fine there. But eventually I need to update, upgrade my RDS and maybe do a test of my disaster recovery procedure or something like that. How yeah. will your tooling uh, help with that? We will help you upgrade uh, everything else, the Kubernetes, the app, the services. We can do progressive delivery to do a test against the new bit version of your, of your data service. We can work with the uh, ACK libraries to declaratively describe which version of RDS we're pointing to. What we cannot do is give you a GitOps management for what's inside the database itself. But we can help you with everything else. But that's the hard part. That's what I'm looking for. The I don't know. Maybe it's the missing piece at the moment. It's the missing piece. I think it's a lot harder. Um, but you know, for most people, having a way to to get to the hard part is very challenging. That's what I would, what I would say, because they don't know when they are, they don't know if they're even being successful. And what you really want is for them to, to have automation as much as possible for the bits that you described Shlomo as not hard. And then when they get to the place where it's actually difficult, they can really focus on the problem and maybe, maybe solve it manually. Um, I mean, I remember with a few years ago, um, people would do highly available systems. And in about 2010, you would typically not worry too much about network partitions. You'd focus more on um, maintaining consistency and availability for a non-partition system. But as more and more workloads moved into the cloud and systems got bigger and other kinds of apps were introduced, people began to experience more network partitions. And now you can't really release a piece of distributed technology middleware and not have a strategy for dealing with connecting, reconnecting after a network partition. And actually people want that to be automatic, but, but 10 years ago, there was no way of dealing with it. And then five years ago, the state of the art was, you have support for a manual merge, but you don't have automated merges. And so I think this will also happen with databases that um, initially people will ignore it. Then they'll say it's a pain, but they'll ignore it. And then they'll say it's a pain, but you have to sort it out manually. And then there'll be guidance, there'll be documentation to you how to do it. Then there'll be tool support. And then finally, there might be a better solution. That will take 10 years. In fact, I'll make a you, prediction. Your problem, Schleimer, will not be solved in the next four years. Oh. That's OK. Uh, my pension's still much more further out. Yeah. <laughs> We'll still be, we'll be talk, come again in four years' time. We're talking about how great everything has become, how much easier, how we can do this, how we can do that. Culture has begun to accept automation 
and policy as the way forward. What about this database problem? Nah, still not solved. <laughs> Four years ago, there the, the GitOps term wasn't around, so it's quite quite some time. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, you know, there's people. Um, there are some important precedents that should be mentioned. Um, so, in originally in the '90s, by Mark Burgess with Promise Theory, um, really has the main ideas all there. The idea of basically having a contract around a system and uh, that is then provided to a system that has to honor that contract, um, which it does using a different mechanism, which is independent from the mechanism of delivery and creation. And then you had in the later 90s, apparently, Microsoft talked about the model driven data center and tried to do everything in this way. And then you had Subversion and Martin Fowler writing about pipelines and CD. And then you have the Jez, Jez Humble book with Dave Farley, Continuous Delivery 2010. There are sections of that book that say operations should be autonomous based on a description. So if you make a prediction in five years, where will we be? Hopefully not all on Zoom working from home all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, probably not yet on Mars, so we're all still going to be here. Um, I think that a lot more systems will be managed in the way that uh, they are using Kubernetes today. Hang, hang on a second. Sorry. Um, I think containers will evolve. There'll be micro VMs. There's things from functions so that the unit of compute, the packaging will, will change perhaps. Um, but there'll still be more emphasis on the declarative management of that thing. And then we'll continue to have declarative um, models for, for systems management like Kubernetes. Uh, maybe maybe other tools will do it too, like, like uh, Nomad. I don't know much about how that works. Um, there'll be more support inside the uh, cloud providers for a range of scenarios. And the majority of um, new applications will be, will be written in a way that you just focus on the code and almost all of the config and operations is driven declaratively. And um, we'll probably have in five years twice as many programmers as we do today, because that's how the numbers work. Um, and so, yeah, I think this will become accepted more as a normal way of working. Uh, people will be habituated to saying, give me the system I want. Don't make me write the system for you. I'll tell you what I want. You do you do it, you do the how, like in your chart, in your slide, Shlomo. So that turns everybody, I guess, into a sort of product manager, a digital champion. And they'll all be working in, you know, on laptops and cafes still. <laughs> okay. Alexis, you talked a bit about uh, Weave and the kind of things it does for GitOps, being a reference implementation, all, all that. And there are other operators around. Could you describe the like common history and collaboration between, like for example, the Argo project or uh, Rancher has a, a fleet, and maybe there are even other operators. Is there some collaboration? going on or is there some couple of collaboration being planned uh when uh, in the GitOps working group the run i don't think there'll be any collaboration in the GitOps working group around implementations there'll be collaboration on reference materials uh, probably on tests there will certainly be running code but it won't be there won't be what just one reference implementation um i think that Rancher Fleet, I don't know much about it, but we looked at it. It looks like an extremely belt and braces approach to more like a sort of puppet-esque way of doing GitOps for starting out more than one cluster. But it doesn't really do the enforcement uh, operationally. So it has no day two, day three, day four, day five story. There can be divergence. To enforce convergence, you have to redeploy, I think. I could be wrong, so don't hold me to that. Um, with Argo and Flux, those are the most similar tools. Uh, Flux has Flagger, which is much more sophisticated than Argo rollouts. The main difference is Argo CD has a concept of an application, which is very opinionated, it's perfectly okay, but it's tied up with the whole architecture so that the security model and the user interface 
and the application design all fit together into a single workflow uh, deployment concept, which means that, um, for example, you're committed to using Argo's own roles-based access control and user database rather than um, the Kubernetes RBAC. So they're not integrated. Whereas with Flux, for example, everything's driven by Kubernetes RBAC, which I think is much safer. Also, if you look at the um, a critical version, critical vulnerability exception, CVEs, Argo has over 300 reported on tools like SNCC um, because it has so much extra software. And I think you download over, over, um, you know, over a gigabyte of images and packages, maybe one and a half gig. Whereas Flux, I think, is currently 40 megabytes. So it's, it's only really narrowly focused on doing certain things. Um, Flux 2 introduces the notion of a pipeline and is very extensible. So that's the one that's being baked into cloud vendors. Whereas Argo, I said, is more opinionated. Um, it is extensible, but by extending the opinion rather than by changing the opinion. So I think that they both have their place in the world. We did try very hard to work with them. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't quite find a way to combine the, they, they were thinking, focusing it slightly on different layers of the stack and had a different set of opinions about how that should work, which meant that we couldn't quite find a way to mesh everything together. It's, it's, it's a shame, it's no hard feelings. Um, I think what we're gonna do is kind of develop independently for a bit, and then maybe we'll see another attempt at convergence in the future. It, I mean, the tools work in a similar way so it's, it's, it's definitely a possibility. But at the moment, it's not really possible to integrate Flux with Argo due to the tightly coupled nature of the UI, the security model, and the application model. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Those are interesting insights. Yeah, I don't think that I have much more questions. There was a lot of input from you, Alexis. Something to, to ponder about. What and I also... What, what's the plan for this uh, recording? Are you going to publish it uh, as a video or write up something? What's the deal? So the idea is that um, I'll try to transcribe it. No promises here. And uh, I'll give you a review copy, definitively, which you I will kindly ask you to sign off on. Right. And then the idea is to put the video essentially uncut on YouTube as uh, as a contribution to What About GitOps, an interview with Alexis. Uh, I think a lot of things that you mentioned here are very interesting also for a wider audience. And um, I plan to add this to my blog. Johannes, probably also, you will do something with that. Uh, Alexis, feel free to use it as well. Um, plus, right. uh, I will try to put an excerpt excerpt from your of your answers into our article uh, in a German translation, unfortunately. That's great. Now, um, our head of marketing is German. So I, you know, she can always tell me what it says. I, Very good. <laughs> I would love to see that. Um, please share anything that you can, including the recording. Um, you know, feel free to cut out bits where, you know, people get up to go outside for a second or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think that's good. Um, thank you very, very much for the questions and the time today. I really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope that I've left you with the impression that it's an exciting area that, that needs more development, not a triviality or a done deal by any means. Thank you for your time. Um, I took your advice and contacted you in the uh, working group GitOps on the CNCF Slack. So I'll be happy to help with anything I can help with. Thank you. All right. Uh, and Johannes, thank you too.